In this video, we will take a look at the potentially harmful effects of ultraviolet light and discuss how to protect yourself. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist practicing in Santa Cruz, California. Living beside the Pacific Ocean, I get a lot of questions about sunglasses regarding both comfort and protection. In the first sunglasses video, we covered the features that improve comfort, that is darkness level, tint color, and polarization. It is important to know that none of these features block potentially harmful ultraviolet light, which is the subject of this video. In this illustration, we are showing that sunlight contains many wavelengths, or a spectrum, of what is called electromagnetic radiation. Here is the part of the spectrum we are interested in. On the left end is infrared, which has a long wavelength and is responsible for the warmth you feel from sunlight. In the middle is visible light, that colors our world. Ultraviolet light is past the blue end of the visible spectrum, thus the name ultraviolet. It is divided into three regions, UVA, B, and C. As the wavelengths get shorter, they contain more energy and have more potential to cause damage. If the idea of electromagnetic waves carrying energy seems suspect, think about how your microwave oven works to heat your food. Even though the sun emits energy over the whole spectrum, not all of it reaches the surface of the Earth. Almost all of the most energetic UVC is absorbed by the atmosphere, so that is not a threat. UVB is mostly absorbed by the ozone in the atmosphere. Usually less than 5% reaches the Earth's surface, but this has the most potential to cause damage. UVA is the opposite, with more than 95% reaching the Earth's surface but it takes a lot more exposure to UVA to equal the effects of UVB. UV exposure varies with a number of factors listed here, starting with season. The EPA publishes a UV index, which can be viewed for individual cities or for the whole US. This map shows average UV intensity over a single month. This is the scale of intensity. If you're interested in more details, their website is noted at the bottom. They make recommendations for what level of protection should be used for each level of the UV index. Just for fun, let's follow the UV index over a year. As you might expect, November, December, and January are the lowest exposure months. By May, UV intensity is increasing significantly reaching its highest levels in June and July, then decreasing noticeably by September, and by November back to the winter lows. Compare that to Australia. This is July, winter down under, with their lowest intensity exposure. Note the colors in the index scale are slightly different, with fuchsia representing extreme exposure. And here is January. The whole country, except Tasmania, is just different levels of extreme intensity. The consequence of that exposure is that Australia has one of the highest rates of skin cancer in the world, four times that of Canada, the US, and the UK. UV levels increase as you go toward the equator. You got a hint of that from the US maps, but on the world map it is more noticeable. This map from NASA shows estimated UV exposure being impressively high around the equator. UV levels increase with higher altitude, increasing 5% for every 1,000 feet above sea level. So if you are skiing at 8,000 feet, you have a 40% increase in UV exposure. UV exposure is most intense in the middle hours of the day. That is because when the sun is overhead, there is less atmosphere in the way to absorb the UV compared to when the sun is at a lower angle in the sky. Finally, exposure is increased by reflection, which varies considerably with sun angle. From snow and ice, reflection can reach 80%. From sand is about 20%. There are certain medications that can make you photosensitive, this is only part of a long list of those. 
Before we look at the damaging effects of UV, let us take a minute to realize we need a certain amount of UV exposure for our health, specifically to make vitamin D. We get our vitamin D from exposure to the sun, from a few items in our diet, and from vitamin supplements. The process for our own production of vitamin D requires, as a first step, exposure to UVB. The molecule 7-dehydrocholesterol, which is normally present in the skin, is converted by UVB into the first precursor of vitamin D. Two more steps are required, one by the liver and one by the kidney, and you have active vitamin D, which is an important part of the system your body uses to regulate calcium levels. It stimulates calcium absorption from the intestine, calcium retention by the kidney, and calcium deposition in bone, and a few more things I haven't listed here. So we need some UV, but not too much. As you might expect, different skin types respond differently to UV exposure. Some people never tan, only burn, while others sunburn only under extreme circumstances. Melanin pigment is the key because of its protective action in absorbing UV. Here is the practical meaning of those categories, showing the time in minutes of sun exposure to cause skin damage. This graph is from the National Oceanographic Administration, but the scale is the same as in Australia, with fuchsia being the most intense. You can pause here, identify your skin type, and see how long you can stay in the, in the sun. UV damage. It has been clearly shown that cumulative exposure to ultraviolet radiation causes damage to exposed skin and to your eyes. We will discuss the specific effects in a minute. UVB is absorbed by the DNA in the outer skin cells. It is the principal cause of skin damage. UVA penetrates deeper into the skin. While it is many times less potent, it still contributes to damage. Regarding the skin, tanning represents an increase in the melanin pigment. On one hand, it is protective against UV, but tanning is also a result of UV damage. Sunburn is a direct result of overexposure to UVB. Cumulative UV exposure accelerates skin aging, making skin dry, rough, mottled, wrinkled, and irregular. And most important are skin cancers, thought to be overwhelmingly caused by UV exposure. They range from benign growths to locally invasive basal cell and squamous cell cancers to the more deadly melanoma. And UV also causes immunosuppression. Regarding eye structures, the skin of the eyelids develops cancer just the same as any other areas of the skin. The conjunctiva can form a scar-like pterygium in this photo, the dashes outline the wedge-shaped growth, which has grown partly over the cornea. Heavier exposure can affect the cornea, causing painful keratitis, otherwise known as snow blindness, similar to Welder's flash burn. In the lens, UV accelerates cataract development. This is a view through a dilated pupil showing a moderately cloudy cataract. Whether or not the retina is affected remains in question. There are experimental reasons for believing that the retina is particularly susceptible to damage by UV and short wavelength blue light. But in looking at population studies, if there is an association to environmental UV exposure, it is not easy to show. For those who are interested in more about the question of retinal damage, there is a separate video that goes into more detail. Protection from UV. You want transparent materials, like glass, to be as clear as possible, allowing the visible spectrum through but blocking as much of the UV as possible. Regular window glass transmits infrared, visible light, and most of the UV. In your car, for safety reasons, the windshield is made of laminated glass, which blocks almost all of the UV. That is why your photochromic lenses do not darken in the car. The tempered side windows are not as protective but a dark sunroof is quite good. Common materials for eyeglasses include glass, standard CR39 plastic, and newer plastics, polycarbonate and Trivex. This diagram shows the percent of transmission in particular parts of the UV spectrum. 
Untreated glass allows just about all the UVA and some UVB through. Standard plastic, CR39, absorbs more and it can be coated to absorb over 90% of the UV. The newer materials, polycarbonate and Trivex, absorb over 90% of the UV by themselves. So if your glasses are made out of one of these two materials, you don't need additional UV coating. Currently in our optical shop, four out of five lenses that are dispensed are either polycarbonate or Trivex, which are also lighter in weight, are much more impact resistant than glass or plastic, as well as having the high level of UV absorption. The only criticism is they scratch more easily. Choice of glasses also makes a difference. As part of this study, the authors placed UV detectors in the eye sockets of mannequin heads. As you might guess, larger lenses blocked more UV. Even when they covered the lenses with opaque black tape, a significant amount got around the lenses. The authors made the following suggestions. Larger lenses are more protective, and wearing a hat adds significant additional protection. We should take a minute to address the question about sun protection for children. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a summary paper available free online which provides a detailed current discussion and recommendations. Here is the abstract copied in two sections. You can pause and read the abstract here or read the whole article online. It makes the following points. One, childhood exposure to UV poses a significant risk for developing skin cancer. Two, how to balance risk with the need for vitamin D and three, it ends with recommendations for protective measures from UV. Which brings us to general measures for UV protection. This is the list as suggested by most major authorities. Here is the same thing in Australian. Protect your skin with sunscreen and clothing. Wear a hat. Wearing a hat significantly decreases UV exposure to the eyes and face. Don't forget this started as a program about sunglasses and a tanning booth inflicts intentional UV damage, so you can decide if it's worth the risk. This video has been about the risks of ultraviolet exposure and how to protect yourself. The first video covers the features of sunglasses that improve comfort, darkness level, tint color, and polarization. The third video covers effects of light on the retina. If you want to read more about UV exposure and protection, these sites are a good place to start.